Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, can everyone hear me? Um, I realize it's uh, almost lunchtime, but um, I would um, like to ask uh, a, a moment of your time to um, uh, hear me talk about uh, Minimeta Genomics. Uh, my name is Boyk Burgess. I am a postdoctoral scholar in the uh, lab of Steve Quake at Stanford. Um, and we are developing methods to um, uh, uh, allow a more quantitative approach to uh, genomic profiling of complex microbial communities. Um, I'd like to start off uh, by uh, thanking the organizers for a, a great conference and for giving me the opportunity to speak here. And also thank the people whom without this uh, uh, work wouldn't have been possible. Of course, uh, Steve Quake, who's been uh, organizing uh, or uh, developing methods in genomics for uh, quite a while, from single cell genomics to uh, the field of uh, microbial ecology, as I will explain later. Uh, Dr. Brian Yu, uh, he is a former graduate student in the Quake Lab, uh, and we're now working together uh, to further uh, develop the Minimeta genomics method. I, if you are interested in, in this method, I would highly recommend you to look up the uh, publication, which is uh, soon going to be in eLife and is, can be found on the BioArchive. Um, also, others in the Quake Lab for uh, their uh, expertise uh, and, uh, and support uh, in uh, sequencing and um, microbial ecology. Uh, this project is in collaboration with uh, the Department of Energy Joint Genome Institute, uh, partially in collaboration with the lab of Victoria Orphan at Cal Caltech, and partially with the lab of George Church at Harvard, and uh, these are the funding sources. Um, so before I uh, start off about Minimeta Genomics, a little bit about myself. Uh, I finished my PhD in single molecule biophysics in April of 2016. Uh, where I looked at um, how single uh, proteins or uh, polymerases bound to uh, nucleic acid templates. And um, from these binding uh, and processing events, I was able to extract uh, binding lifetimes or polymerase pause lifetimes, which in turn allowed me to um, uh, set up kinetic models for these systems to basically understand and predict them uh, better. Um, and I talk about this because I see a number of parallels between um, the field of single molecule biophysics and what I'm doing now. Uh, it's basically taking the, the physics mindset, um, taking um, apart a uh, initially very complex and messy uh, biological system uh, into its individual components and looking at them one by one and ba basically building up understanding uh, uh, one small step at a time. And so uh, in physics, uh, you have the, uh, the particle in a box system, um, uh, which single mo molecule biophysicists took um, uh, to biology uh, by putting proteins in boxes. And now we're uh, putting genomes or cells in boxes um, which uh, I hope to uh, make clear to you has a number of uh, specific advantages. Uh, so what is the, the scope and scale of uh, the problem uh, here? Um, so at present, there are around 5,000 complete microbial genomes. There are around 11,000 cultured uh, microbial species, and uh, around 10 million 16S uh, RNA sequences reported. Um, and recent predictions place the total number of, or estimate the total number of uh, microbial species around 10 to the 12th. Um, and given the uh, scope and scale of this discrepancy, um, this has been co coined uh, microbial dark matter. And if this uh, number is, is, is true, that would mean that 99.999% of the microbial uh, genetic information uh, on Earth still awaits discovery. Uh, but even if this estimate is, is off by several orders of magnitude, this, the, the scope of the problem is still immense. And so uh, that's why we're uh, developing uh, methods to uh, do this, in, uh, to scan uh, these communities in a more efficient manner. 
so where to start? Um, well, uh, in the lab we have a number of um, uh, microbial communities from uh, extreme environments. And um, uh, we start off with uh, extremophile communities because, well, uh, there's an interest, uh, intrinsic interest in the boundaries of life. Um, they have known to produce a number of useful compounds. Uh, for instance, the TAC polymerase, which was found um, in uh, a Yellowstone hot, hot spring. Um, they're complex, but not too complex. Uh, and um, they provide a, a nice opportunity to look at overarching patterns emerging in extreme environments in uh, geographically separated locations. Um, so the two uh, basic questions that uh, this, uh, in, in microbial ecology, what, uh, what it always boils down to is who is there and what are they doing? Um, traditional methods, uh, bulk metagenomics, uh, approach this by taking an environmental sample, extracting the DNA from all the cells, uh, cutting them up and, and sequencing them. Uh, this basically has a very high throughput, um, but basically treats, treats the environment as a bag of, of DNA. There's no uh, real cellular context. Um, this, uh, the assembly can also be computationally uh, very intensive and challenging, and ultimately has a very low resolution. Um, the other uh, end of the spectrum, we have single cell genomics, where you take a single cell from an uh, environmental sample, extract the genome, amplify the genome, and then um, se sequence uh, the genomes. Uh, this achieves, achieves a very high resolution, of course, uh, is computationally much less uh, complex, but um, has a much lower throughput. And in the case of very complex communities with hundreds or maybe even thousands of species, uh, this would be a daunting task. Um, mini metagenomics um, kind of uh, operates uh, in, in between, uh, occupies a space in between, uh, where we take an environmental sample, um, take a, a subsample of cells, around uh, 1,000 or 10,000 cells uh, per experiment, and distribute these over uh, 96 wells of a commercially available uh, Fluidime C1 platform microfluidic chip. Um, the, uh, the complexity here is, is uh, greatly reduced compared to the original sample. Uh, we lyse the cells, amplify the genomes, uh, attach a well-specific DNA barcode, uh, and sequence it. Uh, afterwards, we assemble the, uh, the DNA into uh, longer contiguous sequences. Uh, we do this per well. This uh, also reduces the computational uh, complexity compared to metagenomics. And afterwards, we uh, assemble longer uh, contigs. Uh, in doing this, mini-major genomics uh, occupies a space uh, uh, with a resolution that can be similar to uh, single-cell genomics, um, but uh, greatly increases the throughput uh, not quite like metagenomics, uh, meta but uh, in the order of 1,000 to 10,000 cells per experiment. Um, two key things to remember are, um, and, and that are important aspects of this assay is that the subsampling reduces the complexity of a community, and the partitioning is a Poisson process. Uh, this adds information that we can later use, as so I'll elaborate on. Um, another key feature of mini metagenomics is basically that you, uh, after your, uh, your sequencing, uh, we, we perform analysis, uh, which I will also elaborate on uh, later in this talk, but basically you, you get your genomes or your species, uh, and then because we have a well-specific barcode, uh, we know exactly where, which, p, uh, which chamber um, each piece of DNA uh, was found in. So we can then go back to these chambers uh, and sequence those deeper. So we can really uh, perform a targeted deep sequencing approach, which uh, no other method could do. So you can really focus the, the cost and power of sequencing on those uh, genomes that you think are most interesting. Um, so uh, the goals here are to uh, perform uh, genomic screening of uh, around 1,000 to 10,000 uh, genomes per experiment. Uh, in that, doing that, demonstrating that uh, 
Uh, we can focus the cost and power of sequencing where it is most needed. Um, we can also uh, then uh, relate the functional gene sets to individual species and really uh, try to answer more um, of not only who is there, but who is doing what and what, what are the different species dependencies. And at a later stage, it uh, would be interesting to uh, look at, um, at patterns emerging in complex microbial communities that experience a similar environmental uh, pressure. Um, there are a number of method development uh, questions uh, that arise. This is not an exhaustive list, but these, this first set, um, uh, like how efficient is lysis, how um, does this partitioning actually improve the assembly, how else can we use the Poisson information, um, it are all related to this Poisson process. Um, and so, for, for example, uh, Brian, in, in Brian's paper, uh, he has uh, this figure where he basically uh, has a number of genomes uh, that he found in his experiments and he basically uh, can uh, create a binary presence map uh, as to in which chamber of the microfluidics chip uh, the, the genome was present. And so you get a binary present map, uh, but it is impossible to, to know exactly if um, a genome in this chamber uh, arose from a single cell or from multiple cells. And so this is something you'd like to know because if you, if you can compare, if you know for sure that you had, had a single cell in a chamber, you can start comparing single cells of the same species across different chambers and look at genetic heterogeneity, et cetera. Um, using Poisson statistics, we can, uh, we can uh, determine a, a co-occurrence threshold. Basically, we know that the probability uh, of co-occurrence of more than one cell per chamber uh, uh, goes up with the Poisson average, uh, so the number of chambers that are occupied. Um, and so here, for example, I took a 1% uh, uh, threshold. Um, this would mean for a 96 chamber experiment uh, a ma that a maximum of 14 chambers uh, would have to be occupied uh, for a 50 chamber experiment, this would be seven uh, chambers maximum. And so the number of chambers sets the dynamic range of, of this, uh, this threshold. Um, so then you can go back to your data and um, basically cross out all the genomes that have a higher than 14 uh, occupancy here and a higher than seven occupancy here and uh, start treating these cells as uh, originating from single uh, single cells and start comparing these single cells over uh, various chambers. Uh, second, the second set of questions uh, depend really on more on uh, community specific parameters. Sorry, so. Yes. Yes. Well, so so if if you have many cells uh, of the same species in a in a similar uh, in one chamber, uh, Poisson statistics would uh, dictate that uh, this species would be present in many more chambers than a, a species that is present uh, only once in a chamber. So you you would see this that from the uh, the Poisson average op occupation over the entire experiment. Um, so yeah, so um, community-specific parameters uh, are, um, um, have a number of questions uh, that um, uh, basically um, like, uh, relate to the scaling of the, of the experiments. Uh, you would initially uh, intuitively assume that measuring more is always better. Uh, but this uh, is uh, not necessarily the case. So um, typically, um, the community complexity is, uh, is um, uh, shown by a, um, so basically like it's assumed that um, microbial communities have um, 
a log normal abundance distribution. So the uh, species uh, abundance fo follows a log normal uh, uh, form. And so if you have two uh, microbial uh, populations, each with an equal number of species, um, a uh, uh, community can be either very simple, so meaning that uh, all species have roughly a similar abundance, or a uh, community can be very complex, meaning that a, uh, the log normal distribution has a high skew, where a low number of species uh, basically dominate the community and mask the presence of the uh, the species with a very low abundance. Um, so if we subject these two, uh, these kind of uh, populations with different log normal uh, abundance distributions to our experiments, what can we expect to see? Can we, um, uh, from one single measurement, know the, uh, the total number of species in a population? Uh, so here I have uh, six environmental samples. I perform a 96 chamber, 10 cell per chamber experiment, so roughly around 1,000 cells. Um, and which sample has the most species? Um, and basically, it's impossible to tell because of this, the, uh, the form, this, uh, of this Q of this uh, abundance distribution. So um, from measuring only once, you would uh, basically uh, say that a, a small community of around uh, 117 species has is uh, a similar size of a large community uh, with 2,400 species. Um, and so uh, doing one measurement basically is not enough and, and uh, this, this uh, abundance distribution can really mask uh, many uh, um, species by increasing, by doing an additional measurement, uh, so by increasing the number of cells per chamber, you would, however, see a large rise in the number of species found in your experiment uh, for the large population, uh, whereas the small population would then turn out to be all, all, almost already complete. Um, so again, this all has to do with the uh, sampling, sampling probability. So for the simple community, the complex community, uh, the sampling probability uh, looks very different. Uh, with sampling a thousand, a thousand uh, cells, you basically almost completely uh, measure this population, whereas here the low abundance species are masked by the presence of high abundance species. Um, so if you increase the number of cells per chamber, uh, you would see that the species with the low abundance would increase only very marginally, while the species with high abundance increase very rapidly. Uh, so there's a, a larger spread in the rates of increase when you increase the number of cells per chamber. Uh, and this, this spread is um, direct, directly proportional to the, um, the abundance uh, distribution of species in your community. Uh, with at the limit of uh, identical um, number of species or identical number of uh, cells for each uh, species, this would be a horizontal uh, line. Um, so the, the rate of uh, abundance increase in your experiment is directly proportional to the, um, the abundance distribution of your population as a whole. Uh, in doing this, so if, if we would do a, a concentration sweep, uh, we could basically map out the uh, population abundance distribution. Um, um, this is the, the per capita. Yes. So, so this this is um, this is the species rank, uh, and this is the increase the rates of increase um, per species, and so we see. Yes, per species rate, rate of increase. So, so if you have uh, a uh, population where a few um, species dominate the, the population, uh, are, are there in a very high abundance in your experiment, you would uh, see those increasing much, at a much faster rate than the species that are there only uh, very sparsely. 
And this basically implies that measuring more uh, is, is not necessarily the smartest thing to do with these kind of um, distributions. So, so how would this look? Um, uh, so if you have a, a simple, simple population and uh, we have our 96 chambers, one cell per chamber would mean roughly around roughly 100 uh, cells in your experiments. Uh, with a and and uh, here this dotted line is a single occurrence. So this is the occurrence threshold in our experiment. We would have around uh, 100 cells of the most abundant species. Uh, this would also be true for a complex community. But as we increase the number of cells per chamber, we would soon see that the simple population almost completely is present in, in the experiment, whereas in the, uh, for the complex community, uh, you would uh, keep on seeing species emerging, and at the same time have uh, species that are present at uh, 10 to the fourth or, or more in your experiment. Uh, this is why scaling doesn't necessarily make sense. So for a complex community, uh, the ratio of the uh, maximum abundant species to the median uh, keeps on increasing. And so basically, you're spending more uh, sequencing costs on, um, on the same species. So we need a smarter way uh, to measure. Uh, however, you can um, tune which species are uh, the concentration such that a certain species of interest are within this single cell uh, range to, to basically look at, uh, uh, well, these species in a single cell uh, genomics fashion. Um, is there an optimum number of cells per chamber? Again, this is uh, highly dependent on the uh, abundance distribution of your community. Um, and for a simple community, there is a, uh, a peak in the, um, in the single cell range whereas for a complex community, this is much less clear, and it also depends on your population size where this peak is. Uh, so basically, uh, what you need to do, would need to do is measure at multiple concentrations. Um, so to conclude this part, uh, Poisson statistics can be used to set a co-occurrence co threshold. Um, the rate at which species increases in occurrence is directly proportional to the relative abundance of a species in a community. Uh, scaling your measurement, measuring more, doesn't necessarily make sense. Um, but here we can um, basically rely on going back to the uh, a specific chamber with a genome of interest and measuring, uh, uh, sequencing that deeper. Uh, the species that fall within the uh, single cell range can be tuned and the optimum number of cells per chamber can be found by varying uh, the cell concentration. Um, so now there are two approaches that are uh, attractive. Basically do a light scan with our mini metagenomics experiment first and then target uh, specific chamber, microfluidic chambers for deep, deeper sequencing um, to in, indeed avoid measuring more of the same species. Um, or we could measure, do a 16S scan first and then target uh, those genomes that uh, we find most interesting. Um, second part uh, is a bit about um, our current work in progress. So we have, uh, a num as I told you, a number of samples in the lab uh, that we are subjecting to these measurements and um, basically developing um, a uh, analysis pipeline uh, for and, and developing quality standards for. So what we do is uh, we take an environmental sample, we perform mini metagenomics and shotgun sequencing together on the same sample to be able to compare these. Uh, we assemble the genomes, um, then we annotate them by um, uploading them to the uh, JGI uh, database. Uh, we do uh, uh, KMER-based um, clustering and uh, dimensionality reduction using TSNE. Probably many of you uh, in metagenomics are familiar with, with this pipeline. Um, and then we uh, cluster or form genomes from, from this uh, TSNE, as I will show. And from this, we can basically uh, do all kinds of analysis. Um, so look at genomes, 
select certain species of interest for deeper sequencing, look at functional interaction, so looking more at the who is doing what. Um, and again, so the, these steps uh, are probably uh, going to be uh, very familiar to uh, many of you. Um, so what have we done? Uh, we've taken five samples from Yellowstone National Park, the obsidian pool. Um, they're from the same pool. They're a hot spring. Um, we perform mini metagenomics and shotgun sequencing. Uh, and we uh, devoted an equal number of sequencing reads uh, to each method, so both to mini metagenomics and uh, metagenomic sequencing. Um, the overall results, uh, so uh, here we uh, have a uh, rank of the number of uh, phyla present in, in the experiments. Uh, five samples, as you can see. Um, one stands out here. This, this one has um, a high presence of cyanobacteria and uh, almost no crenna archaeota. Um, and basically, this also shows that we can uh, reproducibly measure these, um, these communities with minimated genomics uh, since this sample was taken at a lower temperature. Um, what we can do is uh, uh, map uh, the, uh, the amount of DNA back onto the microfluidic chip, uh, as well as the um, uh, assembly quality and uh, the origin of the different sequences. Uh, from this, we get uh, a rank of the different phyla present with their, their assembled length, where uh, roughly um, the assembled length is a good proxy for the number of genes present, as there, you have around a thousand, um, one gene for every kilobase. Um, Minimeta genomics performs very similar to, uh, to bulk uh, metagenomic uh, assembly methods. Um, but also finds more uh, phyla um, that are unique to uh, mini metagenomics and do not appear in, uh, in the metagenomic sequencing uh, efforts. Um, so like I said, we, uh, we do a, a, a K-mer analysis. In, the, in this case, we show a 5 mer analysis, um, and we reduce the dimensionality to be able to, to plot the um, the high dimensional space into uh, two dimensions. And what you get is uh, this cluster data where you have each data point uh, represents uh, an assembled sequence longer than 5,000 uh, base pairs. And um, if we color them by uh, origin, so the metagenomic context versus the mini metagenomic context, you see that there are clusters that are f formed uh, that only mini metagenomics um, finds. Uh, this means that uh, this region of KMER space is only, uh, is only found by the mini metagenomic method, uh, whereas each blue cluster uh, still has underlying um, green uh, contigs, meaning that this is also covered by mini metagenomics, uh, yet uh, uh, not as, as much as the metagenomic method. Um, so, if we look at the, the mini metagenomic context, their clusters, we can look at functionality uh, in, in these uh, clusters. Uh, we can look for specific enzymes. I guess this is all very familiar to people in, in metagenomics. Uh, but additionally, we can map the, the contig occurrence back to, uh, back to the microfluidic chip so we know exactly where each species uh, came from. Uh, so here I'll show a number of, uh, of phyla. The, uh, this, the aquifice, uh all cluster into one uh, region here of the TSNE. Uh, the crena archaeota, uh, this phylum occupies mo more than one cluster, meaning that there are probably a number of subspecies uh, present. And we can basically do this for uh, every uh, phylum present. And um, we can also then get a abundance distribution because we, we have this chip presence, uh, which at this point is not, um, doesn't uh, say too much, but it would be interesting that if you um, increase, the, increase the number of cells per chamber that you see this shift, which I also saw in, in my modeling, um, uh, the simulations that I have done. <coughs> 
Um, there are a number of unassigned contigs which actually occupy the entire uh, space. So um, we basically need to um, find or assign these contigs, uh, which we can then do by clustering the data uh, using HDB scan, which basically clusters the different groups of contigs as you would draw circles around it by eye. Um, then we can compare the clusters found for bulk and mean emitted genomics and overlay them. And again, you see that uh, uh, certain regions are occupied by both mean emitted genomics and bulk. Some are uh, only occupied by mean emitted genomics or only by bulk. Um, then we can also like, start looking at, at functionality. Um, and again, this, uh, for these clusters, we can then look which, uh, which phyla and which species are, are present. And again, also look at the, uh, the occurrence in the chip. Um, this uh, gives us a different type of ranking, so not uh, based on phylum, but based on cluster, where many here are unassigned, and it's now the task to basically uh, figure out what, which species uh, uh, these represent. Uh, we can uh, rank them by assembled length, but actually more importantly by the number of cells. And the order of this changes because there's not necessarily a strong correlation between the assembled length and the actual abundance of a species in, a, uh, in an experiment or in a, um, in a population. Uh, so this mini metagenomics platform is really the only uh, reliable way to uh, infer the relative abundance of species because you could you cannot reliably do that by looking at the total assembled length. Um, abstracting one step further is uh, we can represent the uh, the clusters by uh, spheres with the radius proportional to the assembled length uh, and start looking um, at um, which uh, are the most abundant phyla associated with those clusters. And then, uh, uh, since we also map this to the KEG database, uh, start looking at uh, functionality of, um, of our uh, genomes. And uh, basically, if you zoom in onto these, these uh, functional, uh, uh, these functions, uh, you basically start seeing that not every genome is performing the, the, uh, the same uh, task, not everyone is doing everything, and here uh, it really becomes interesting to uh, look at the who is doing what and uh, how we could infer uh, species dependencies. So for instance, nitrogen metabolism um, definitely does not occur in every uh, genome. Um, and then if we look at a specific uh, uh, pathway here, uh, we can uh, look, um, so uh, which is nitrate reduction. Um, this first step, ni nitrate to nitrite, can be either done by a three subunit uh, enzyme or by a two subunit enzyme, and we can start looking where, in which species the, these are present, uh, and uh, two subunit uh, enzymes for the second step. Um, and so, um, here, uh, obviously, the, the um, problem of how complete is your genome um, starts occurring, so we need to treat this uh, with care and, and, and develop um, um, quality scores for, um, for genome uh, completeness. But um, this, this is uh, still work in progress. So to conclude, um, so this is an easy to use platform um, and ideally to, suited to analyze complex microbial communities. As a matter of fact, I would um, want to challenge this system by uh, uh, moving away from uh, um, extremophile communities only, but also looking at, at the highly complex communities, uh, soil and microbial communities, for instance. Um, the sequencing data provides uh, complementary information to shotgun or bulk sequencing. Uh, but also, uh, as you saw, additional, um, uh, many additional phyla that were not present in the bulk um, sam uh, sequencing data. Um, and it enables a more quantitative approach to genomic screening of environmental samples. 
Um, and the abundance of phyla and genomes can be inferred through this chip presence, as can the functional abundance, so the, function, the abundance of a certain uh, uh, gene set. Um, so we're looking forward to further developing the analysis pipeline, um, demonstrating this deeper sequencing of specific wells, uh, doing single cell analysis by looking at uh, uh, SNPs and uh, general genetic heterogeneity within a species, um, and in, in doing that show that we can measure smarter uh, by not just uh, throwing all the sequencing power at every, uh, every species out there, but really focusing it on uh, the most interesting uh, or curious species. Uh, with that, I'd like to uh, conclude and thank you. And uh, also, if you have any uh, communities um, that you would like to subject to this method, I would be happy to talk about uh, collaborating. So, thank you.